My name is Gordon, your host for this episode, along with my co-host Linda and our guest Injide Ndili. Injide is the country director for Farm Access Foundation in Nigeria and serves as a commissioner for the Lancet and Financial Times Commission Governing Health Futures 2030. She is a vice president of the Healthcare Federation of Nigeria, a coalition of private sector healthcare associations advocating for the inclusion of the private sector in Nigeria's healthcare delivery system. She has over 25 years of leadership experience in the healthcare industry in the United States and Nigeria, and has also worked as a consultant for several healthcare organizations. She is a trustee of the Nigeria Healthcare Excellence Award and a board member of the Society for Quality in Healthcare in Nigeria. Injide has a Master of Science in Health Economics, Policy and Management from the London School of Economics, completed the AMP from the INSEAD Business School in France, an MBA from the University of Houston, a postgraduate diploma in finance, and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the University of Nigeria. Injide, welcome to the Public Health Insight Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Wow. So that's where we're going to get into those uh, diplomas and degrees in a second. But I wanted to talk to you about uh, your current role as the country director for Farm Access Foundation. So tell us about the organization and your role there as the country director. So Farm Access Foundation is an international NGO um, headquartered in Amsterdam. Um, we are actually, we have the objective of making healthcare better, just to put it simply, um, mm. trying to work in an integrated manner to enable people that ordinarily wouldn't have access to healthcare uh, gain access. That is looking at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so we are in Nigeria, we're in Ghana, Kenya, and Tanzania, and uh, we are predominantly funded by the Ministry of uh, Sustainable Development uh, uh, in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So it's uh, kind of seen as aid to trade to some of these governments, including Nigeria. So we support uh, not just the federal government, but the state government, as well as work together with private sector organizations just to help strengthen the healthcare system, as well as transfer technical assistance um, to our partners so that at some point, hopefully I don't have a job and the expertise that we have has been transferred to, um, you know, some of our stakeholders to carry on the work. Awesome. And circling back to the wonderful accomplishments that you've had over your career so far, we have been podcasting for a couple of years and we often get students asking us questions. What is public health education, global health? Uh, what is a global health experience, public health experience? And I imagine that you have a unique experience on this, having acquired a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, postgraduate diploma in finance, an MBA and several other uh, degrees. So can you talk about uh, the ways in which these uh, educational programs have enhanced your career and how are you using it right now? So it, it's really an interesting journey for me uh, because uh, my passion has always been in computers, programming, uh, but very mm -hmm. quickly once I got into the, the healthcare sector, uh, interestingly, I started my career in the United States um, working as a temp in uh, one of the larger uh, HMOs, um, which is um, Independence Blue Cross. So basically what I did was use my computer skills to create efficiency around the processes. Yeah, so we had, I was in the department uh, involved with credentialing. So how do we credential the doctors, how we develop a database that would help streamline their data so it's easier to credential them it's easier to develop a, um, a complaints database that can track complaints against them such that when the, it comes time for them to get recredentialed, uh, then it's easier. But having said that, I think that it was a natural progression uh, because what I find in the healthcare industry, 
is that it's all about data. People don't quite seem to realize it. You, you, without the data that is generated within the healthcare system, you cannot uh, determine uh, the outcomes, you cannot improve the system, and so on and so forth, even encounters and so on. Uh, so it was uh, really instrumental for me. So uh, I started my career through the health maintenance organizations in the United States. Um, I tra transitioned back to Nigeria because I felt that I had more to add here uh, in developing the healthcare system. For a, a particular reason, which I'll come to later, um, but in Nigeria, we, I realized that uh, at the time I came back, I think it was 2003, uh, the government has just enacted a law making uh, health insurance, um, you know, it, it's called the National Health Act putting together the national health insurance scheme where there's a scheme for the country uh, that needed to be implemented such that we can transition to uh, kind of universal health coverage or mandatory health insurance. But a lot of mm -hmm. uh, organizations were struggling. They didn't have the systems. They didn't have, you know, even the coding methodology is standardized across board and so on. So that's really how my, uh, my career started. So I got really involved in quite a number of the organizations because of my computer background, I was helping develop algorithms and systems, matching fee schedules, the contract lines, and so on. Um, but after a while, I realized also that working for one uh, organization doesn't really help the entire industry. So I thought, okay, I need to go back to school to understand from a broad perspective uh, what I need to be looking at in terms of policy, uh, what I need to be looking at if you want to strengthen a system or, or improve a healthcare system just based on international standards. And really that took me back to uh, London School of Economics, um, which was really, really uh, eye-opening because, you know, you learn about other countries' health systems, what you can learn and bring back. You study the Canadian system, the US system where I came from, the UK system. Then you look at the systems in Africa and you find that it's really not up to par. So uh, I think bringing all that experience together uh, is really the driving force uh, behind uh, you know, my career trajectory. So um, the story I was going to tell you uh, is that you know, I come from a family of uh, medical people um, I was in the United States for many years, same as my siblings, most of them are still there. But I had my parents back here in Nigeria, and when I came back, they were being treated. Uh, my dad uh, was actually very ill, and he was being treated for cough. Meanwhile, he had a kidney failure. So that just gives you a sense of um, the kind of system we have where people are not able to get proper quality care because of either diagnostics, mm -hmm. access to care, and all that. Uh, to cut the long story short, he was moved to the United States um, by my siblings who were still there, and he never came back. He died. Uh, my mom, who was the primary caregiver and left with him, also died. Um, so, you, you know, my driving force really is how can I help change the system here, you know, so that other people like me mm -hmm. um, don't have their parents dying in another man's country just because the system mm -hmm. uh, within their own country, especially in Africa, is not good. So I think that's really my driving force. So there's a lot um, that still needs to be done to, to improve the healthcare system here. Mm. That is a powerful driving force. And yeah. it sounds like you're seeing the gaps in the data infrastructure. And so you're trying to fill those gaps to avoid preventable deaths. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, working for Farm Access, uh, which is a very unique organization, um, is something that I love doing because it looks at the entire ecosystem and we work in an integrated manner. So we're not just looking at the demand side which is the ability to pay insurance, but we're looking at the supply side, quality improvement within the facilities. We're looking at behavioral change of the, of the patients and the community so they better take care of themselves. We also get involved in policy, working sometimes with the World Bank, uh, because we do impact evaluations on our innovations. And if we feel that something needs to be changed, then we, you know, we write a report and we then have World Bank work with us, uh, with the regulators uh, to change policy. But most important is the digital 
technology aspect of it. Because without that underlying foundation uh, of using digital, we are not able to capture any data or even uh, track our progress or quantify our progress. And I think that is really now the core of what we do uh, within Farm Access. So moving on to this digital technology piece, you are part of the group at the Lancet Financial Times Commission, and this is a huge deal. You released this report on how to harness uh, digital technologies for the future of health. And um, we'd like to chat a little more about that. But before we get into more detail, can you talk just from a high level what this uh, Governing Health Futures report is about? Yes. So for the first time uh, in 2019, the Lancet, uh, which I'm hoping you uh, are very familiar with, uh, came together with Mm -hmm. the Financial Times to set up this commission. Uh, The commission was set up really to explore the convergence of digital health, uh, artificial intelligence, and frontier technology, and how we could use that to achieve universal health coverage, especially especially for developing countries and young people, you know, um, you know, and also using it to attain the sustainable development goal number three. Um, so we, the, the commission uh, searched really widely uh, and identified 17 commissioners from very different backgrounds, some behavioral change, some technology, some policy, some youth empowerment and engagement. Um, it really brought us together under the leadership of two uh, co-chairs, uh, Il- Ilona Kukbush and Anna Rag, uh, who is uh, based in India. And... Uh, Funny enough, uh, as we launched the commission in October 2019, you you may recall that that was when COVID started. So it really, (laughs) um, you know, tested our our resolve and made our work really Mm -hmm. critical because now we were were forced to walk offline. I was a commission that was set up for, um, we had a, a, a time period of two years to get together our work. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, consulting with young people, with policymakers, with developmental partners, with you know um, different countries. Um, I was one of the commissioners. Uh, there were two of us from Africa, um, especially because Africa has uh, the ten youngest countries in the world. I'm sure you know, um, well, I don't know if you know, but 60% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa is under 30 years old. So it was a way to uh, bring together uh, this diverse group of people to look at how digital can be used to accelerate UAC because we're trying to achieve universal health, health coverage by 2030. Uh, which is why it was named, you know, growing up in a digital world. Because, yes, these kids are growing up in a digital world. How do we ensure equity? How do we ensure access? How do we ensure digital governance Um, and human rights? Uh, But I'll talk a little bit about that further down the line because there was a lot revealed from that report uh, that Mm -hmm. is very instrumental and really has to now change the way we look at healthcare. And we look at access to healthcare. Yes. Um, so, so I'll stop there, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about the, the the report and the recommendations coming from it. Absolutely. So let let's let's talk about it. So, what are those pressing issues that were identified in terms of the health system for Nigeria, the African content on lo- at large? Uh, you know, what are those? fundamental things that need to happen for universal health coverage by 2030, as identified in your report? So um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's just for Africa. It's a recommendation Mm -hmm. for all countries uh, in the world, regardless Mm -hmm. of where you are in your journey towards UHC. Uh, But first of all, uh, some of our key messages, because we had some key messages and some recommendations. One is that Mm -hmm. we need to begin to recognize uh, the importance of digital health, digital transformation as a new determinant of health. Um, 
you know, a lot of young people as well as older people are looking to the internet for their health information. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the way they see themselves, the way they act, the way the, you know, they access information about healthcare is through the internet or their mobile phones. So mm -hmm. it has to be recognized that data, digital transformation is a new determinant of health. And that is the starting point. Two is that, that there has to be um, a culture of data justice, right? Uh, and when I talk about data justice, mm. data uh, justice and equity, because in some countries like Africa, especially, you wouldn't believe it, but data is really, really expensive. And when you talk about connectivity mm. and achieving universal health coverage using or leveraging digital technology, how can you achieve that if you're not accessing, um, uh, you're not, first of all, you're not connected in order to even be seen and mm -hmm. be counted and be connected. So we're saying that data has to be considered really instrumental and has mm -hmm. to be available so that the young people can have access to better healthcare services. Can you hear me? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, yes. Still, I think Linda's so, camera I, got turned I off. But you're good, you're good. Oh. This camera went off. <laughs> yeah, I realize. No, no, yeah. it, 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 it'll happen every now and then. But no, yes. So on, on that point, talk about the, the data justice piece. And you mentioned now that in countries like Nigeria, data can be quite expensive. Why is that the case? Is it because of the is a private industry own taking ownership of that data, that power asymmetry? What's what are those reasons for the the uh, quite expensive nature of data and accessibility in Nigeria? So uh, first of all, the, the infrastructure that is being provided right mm -hmm. now uh, that enables data is provided by private sector, and they're making a lot of mm -hmm. investments into the country. And you, you expect that they would recoup their investments. So we have the likes of um, uh, MTN, which is one of the largest uh, mobile telcos. Mm -hmm. You have Airtel. They are investing a lot of money, uh, putting in, uh, you know, their masks and their cables all over the place. And it's costing a lot. So this is an effort to recoup some of that investment. Uh, but unfortunately, it has, you know, uh, it, it has its, um, it, its uh, ripple effect because in as much as Nigeria, which is a country of over 200 million people, uh, over 70 percent of the people live on less than two dollars a day. But yet we have one of the most expensive uh, data access costs in the world. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and it, uh, taking it even a bit further, um, less than 5% of this population have any access to health insurance. Okay. Um, so it makes the situation even worse. Okay. So you have, um, mm -hmm. a situation where there is limited access, limited infrastructure, you have the, the developing infrastructure in the hands of the private sector. The private sector is way ahead in terms of capacity and knowledge than the regulators and the government. And that's basically a recipe for exploitation, if, you, if, I, if I can mm -hmm. use that word. Um, so this is also recognized in our report that for us to achieve universal health coverage, leveraging on digital technology, especially for Africa, that we need to start investing in the enablers. Okay, when we talk about enablers of digital health and digital transformation, we're talking about electricity. You cannot have digital transformation when, you know, I'm looking at my light and saying, okay, I, I hope the light doesn't go while we're in the middle of this. <laughs> light yeah? off. Well, that's the, the, the world we live in. Yeah. And it happens yeah. quite often. Yeah. Uh, two is now when you have uh, 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 electricity, do you have connectivity? Can you afford the data? Do you have mm -hmm. the digital literacy? 
to understand how to even use uh, the digital tools and so on. So for governments mm -hmm. and even development partners, you know, you have a lot of investment coming into uh, uh, Africa through, you know, Google, Microsoft, all of them are setting up shop, Facebook. Um, can mm -hmm. they invest in the enablers? Uh, can they uh, support the government in investing in the enablers? Can the government take ownership in terms of regulation? Can we, you know, put a benchmark or a threshold or some kind of ceiling um, that doesn't have to be surpassed for a certain group of people so that they are, they are connected? So these are some of the things that we are also recommending. And I always call it the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of uh, digital transformation because you have to start at the baseline mm. and begin to layer on yeah. um, services on top of that. Yeah. So that so is I really... just want to, uh... oh no, continue, please continue. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to focus a little more on the African context to kind of paint the picture for listeners who may not be familiar. So in my experience, so my family's from Ghana. And so in my experience, uh, when you are trying to buy credit or something for your phone, it's not how typically in the North American context you may have a contract and then you're paying monthly. It's more so you buy credit, you put on your phone, the credit is finishes, then you buy more credit. And so in my mind, it's accessible because anyone can buy credit and when it finishes, you're fine, you just buy more later. But it sounds like from what you're saying, that is just the bare minimum. Just because it's accessible does not mean that it is um, that these private companies are doing this in an equitable way. And so it sounds like you're saying there should be more responsibility on these enablers to um, operate in an ethical manner instead of just uh, for profit. Am I get, um, along the right lines of what you're saying or? Um... You're yeah, somewhere in between. Uh, first of all, I recognize the fact that the private uh, sector making the investment have to recoup their investment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are highlighting the fact that the high cost of some of that investment is detrimental to mm -hmm. a segment of the population. So the question is whether right. they can partner with government. Whose responsibility is it, really? Uh, we are putting mm -hmm. it on the government that they should play a more central yes. role in determining you know, how those infrastructure are put in place and the pricing for that so right. that people are included and not ex excluded. Right. I think that's the case that we're so making. If someone's you're living right. on, so if someone's living on $2 a day, they're not spending their only $2 on catching up to this uh, digital age that we live in and spending it on credit when if they actually need that for food. So you're saying we should have more government intervention to make this accessible for everyone. Yes, and you know, I'll give you a, a fact uh, that the largest uh, telecom company in Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. MTN, they make their most profit on those that spend less than a dollar on credit a month. No, oh my God! I'm not joking. Yes, so the, the, their biggest profit band is on those that spend mm -hmm. less than a dollar a month on credit. Wow. Why? Because there are so many of them mm. and they, 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 they recharge often as opposed to people like yeah. me, you know, I, I, you know, I'm actually on postpaid. I'm not buying credit. So mm -hmm. I talk less mm -hmm. and, you know, I can mm -hmm. control my expenditure, but they are, you know, sometimes it's between, uh, uh, talking and eating. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's between, talking and going to the hospital yeah. but especially for nigerians we talk a lot so you find that people spend a lot <laughs> of money on credit and that's mm. where why um and yeah. nigeria is in one of their biggest markets interesting and so, so uh, if go ahead Linda. okay go ahead go ahead no go ahead i was gonna transition so if you if you're still on it go ahead yeah no i was just gonna say if digital literacy is then considered or as a key determinant of health, then it would be more of an incentive for governments, for uh, private sector, et cetera, to make sure that it's accessible and equitable. Just to summarize. Yes, yes. but, but uh, you know, the digital mm -hmm. literacy cuts across board, 
not just for the users, but also for the regulators mm -hmm. to understand the power of digital literacy, because it can mm -hmm. actually help accelerate their work, um, especially mm -hmm. in healthcare, because I think that's where we're seeing the potential, especially for mobile technology to, to aggregate right. funding and direct people to better access uh, of healthcare. So on that note, how do governments ensure that the proper governance models are in place to prevent the widening of that digital div divide that you speak of and that not the and prevent the exploitation of those who are potentially most vulnerable? How, how would the governments go about do, doing that? Well, I, I think that we're still at the uh, early stages of um, seeing this explosion. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. penetration of digital technology, penetration of mobile technology. So, um, and I, I must say that our own report is quite timely because we are now at the point of engagement and we're talking about, um, you know, better regulation, better governance uh, of uh, digital technology, better, you know, uh, um, people should have data or rights over their data and things like that. Mm. But uh, yeah, to, to go back to your question, uh, there's very limited uh, intervention right now uh, from the regulators. I mean, there are agencies that have been set up um, to monitor, uh, like in Nigeria, we have what, what you call the NCC. Uh, they actually determine, um, you know, who gets connected, uh, the rules around getting connected, like in Nigeria, to get a SIM now, you have oh, wow. to have your biometrics, your picture taken. It's almost like an identity uh, for mm. you to get a SIM. And a lot of that is actually happening around uh, Africa. But in, that in and of itself is also good because all of a sudden it gives an identity to the owner of the phone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, you, when we talk about population census, um, knowing where people are so they are not left behind, you have to be able to find them first. Who are they? Where are they? And we're finding point. that yeah. the mobile phone, because of the process you go through um, from the regulator, you're better able to identify who owns the phone. You mm -hmm. can keep track of them. You know, you know, even from the data that is being mined uh, in terms of utilization, you can actually tell their, their income level, uh, sometimes educational level. So there's a lot of data being mined. So we are mm -hmm. now moving towards better regulation, but we also recognize that there's capacity building that needs to happen on the regulations, on the side of the regulators, mm -hmm. Um, they need to better understand the power of mobile and digital technology um, to help accelerate some of the work uh, that is being done within the country. And I think Kenya is a very good example. Uh, Kenya with M-Pesa, uh, where you have mobile money. Um, you know, I think about 10% of the GDP uh, is going through the phone compared to 2% in, in, in Europe. And all of a sudden, you know, you don't have to have a bank account. You can transfer and, and transact through using mm. mobile money on your phone. And I think that's something that um, Farm Access has leveraged on in Kenya because we now created a, a, a health wallet called MTBA, where you can actually put in mm. uh, funds specifically for health. So these are some of the innovations that are coming out of Africa. Even though there's limited um, infrastructure, there's uh, limited regulation, it's promoting uh, innovation because we have to work with the bare minimum, mm -hmm. the least, lowest hanging fruit, what is available in the hands of the people that we can use to either improve their access to care um, or to better monitor uh, the, their well-being and so on. So I think uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a huge trajectory uh, and possibility that uh, uh, coming out of Africa that is leapfrogging even the rest of the world. Uh, a lot to learn mm -hmm. uh, from the innovations coming out of here. Absolutely. I think that helps to kind of flip the narrative that's often told about Africa and Africans in general as like, 
being the ones in need always and mm-hmm. waiting for intervention from elsewhere. This is like innovation coming from within. And I think that's a really cool story to also tell, not just the one we always hear. Mm-hmm. Yep. So something that really s- stuck out to me when I read this report is there was a lot of intentional effort made to highlight the voices of young people and to say that young people need to be included to achieve these UHC goals by 2030. So I'd love to hear from you. Why was this necessary? Why did this report need to highlight young people? So the young people are the future. I mean, they are really (laughs) going to inherit the systems that are being created right now. Um, And Mm -hmm. I I think that it's very intentional because the young people have a broad mind. Uh, You know, the possibilities are endless. They are the ones growing up in a digital world. Um, Some of us are are catching up to to the digital technology, but they are (laughs) growing up in it. I mean, what you and I, when we were growing up, we were outside run, riding our bicycles and all that. But no, this uh, generation are mm-hmm. on their phone. So the question is, how do we recognize that and uh, leverage on their breadth of thinking, their innovation, their, you know, their, their curiosity, and bring all that together? Interestingly, um, at the time we started this report, I uh, organized a youth consultation in Nigeria. I brought together about 130 young people, including my daughter, by the way, um, just to get a sense <laughs> of what they think about healthcare, uh, what they think about digital health. And even I was shocked. Number one is most of the youth are not even covered by any kind of health insurance, right? They are either in in between, they're they're too old uh, to be covered under their parents' insurance, and they're too, too, and then they don't have a job sometimes, uh, so they don't Mm -hmm. have coverage from their companies. You know, between that age of 18 and and, um, 30, I would say, especially for Nigeria. Uh, Second thing was, you know, the idea of uh, healthcare benefits is, you know, counseling, um, image, you know, the, how do I look, obesity, family planning, you know, things that are actually normally excluded from the benefit package. That's another thing. Ooh, good point. Uh, thirdly, is that they are never consulted. They are never consulted when mm-hmm. uh, there's a design or even in developing the benefit package or anything to do with the healthcare system. You know, mental health issues, Mm -hmm. you know, they're they're dealing with a lot of the peer pressure and all that. It's not covered usually in the benefit package. So at this consultation, I actually had some of the regulators uh, of our national health insurance systems, uh, commissioners of health in the room with them. And some of them were, are you serious? Are they listening to us? (laughs) I mean, the shock of being included, somebody's listening to me. Uh, It was all inspiring. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, it's something that needs to happen going forward. They're a large constituency. I mean, the minority is making the decisions for the majority, especially for Africa. We have Mm -hmm. majority young people, Mm -hmm. but yet the minority are making the rules and policies. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't hurt Mm -hmm. to listen to them. To, to take some of their ideas and feed it into this. It can only improve the system. Um, for example, Absolutely. some of the ideas that they came up with is, you know, um, can you have an anonymous booth where you can go and ask questions about, um, uh, you know, uh, reproductive health, uh, mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't want to talk to their mothers. They don't want to talk to their peers. Right. And again, we're seeing a lot of the stigma uh, there. Dying because they're going for uh, uh, unhealthy abortions or illegal abortions. So things mm-hmm. like that. Um, how can we listen to them and infuse some of their ideas to improve the system which they are going to inherit? Um, talk about telemedicine. Mm-hmm. Why should they go into the hospital when they can call the doctor and he can see me? Do I really have to go in there? <laughs> you know, things like that. So um, it, it was really awesome to listen to them. 
And uh, this is what mm-hmm. the regulators took away that, you know, there has to be a pathway uh, to include their ideas. Even with Governing Health Futures, we did a lot of consultation with uh, the youth across um, the, in all the continents, uh, made possible by COVID, mm-hmm. because I'm sure if we didn't have COVID, we wouldn't have thought about virtual yeah. connectivities and you right. know, dialogues yeah. and so on. We even set up a youth forum uh, for them to, you know, do like futuristic play play role and tell us what you think health of the future could would look like. So for this report, we mm. have That's so uh, cool. another track which has been documented, which is a youth statement. We have a youth uh, um, uh, right. con- a consortium that is working with us to make sure that their voices are included. So I think that um, the youth are a powerful group but they don't know they have that voice yet. Um, we are pushing through this mm-hmm. report for their inclusion. Uh, we looked at the digital strategies of about 10 countries in Africa, and none of them had any um, track for, for the wow. youth. So these are some of the things that we want mm-hmm. to change going forward with the engagement of policymakers to ensure that the youth uh, voices are included in, in, in some of the strategies being developed. Mm. So the outcomes of digital transformation will not meet the needs of young people unless they're included in the whole design process bottom up. That's kind of, the, the, that's, it seems like that's been the shortfall all along. Yes. And this is not uh, peculiar to oh. Africa. The same is happening in the rest of mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Yep. That, yep. Uh, I think that Absolutely. was something Especially that, that came point out you very made. clearly. I'm sorry? Mm. Mm-hmm. The point you made about services that young people need or that they prefer not being covered, that just seems so common sense. Why wouldn't the services that they need be covered? But if they're not consulted, it's the same everywhere. So, yeah, that was eye-opening for me. Yeah. Is that a product of just doing things the way they've always been? You know, the healthcare coverage typically includes X, Y, Z. There's no need to change. I think that, well, the, the most important thing is that the people designing it are not the young people. They are, they are designing it based on what they know. Mm-hmm. They're designing it mm-hmm. ba- based on history. Um, why yeah. should I? I mean, nobody has ever thought about, we're not aware in all our consultations in, in the commission of the young people being included or consulted to develop some yeah. of these policies and benefits. So if you're not aware, then mm-hmm. why would you think about it? And again, re- if you recall what I said, a lot of these young people are not even covered by any insurance. You know? Yeah. 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 You, you, typically, you get covered when, you, when you're employed or when you're young enough to be covered by mommy and daddy's uh, insurance. So what happens to that band mm-hmm. in between? You're floating and looking to the internet for solutions. Yeah. Question about that. I know for, at least for in Canada, students do get some kind of extended health benefits through when they enroll in post-secondary. Is that not the case in, in other countries in, in Africa as well? Or, okay. So that's a big, that's a, even yeah. more of a gap than it is in other countries. Yeah, and no, it, it's not. Uh, it's in fact, uh, I'm working right now because, as I mentioned, Pharmax has uh, works with quite a number of state governments uh, to design benefit packages, and we're currently supporting one of the um, southeast states, Kwara State, to develop a benefit package for students. Yeah. So, you Mm -hmm. know, it's because it's devolved to the states, they can determine what to do. I know at the federal level, they're looking at, uh, they call it the T-ship, which is for university students, but that is not compulsory. You know, it's it's being done on an Mm -hmm. ad hoc basis. So as we are talking about achieving universal health, health coverage, we're looking for a more systematic approach where it is mandatory Mm -hmm. Uh, we're waiting for that bill to be signed such that if you are a citizen of any state, you should have some kind of health insurance. And depending on where you fall in the band, because, you know, 
There are those who cannot afford to pay, like I talked about the 70% uh, living on less than $2 a day, then the responsibility should be with the state government to subsidize or cover their premium, while those who can afford to pay employed at the top of the pyramid are paying into a pool so that there's some kind of risk sharing mm-hmm. uh, to, to make it sustainable. Mm. So it's, it, yeah, so th- that is really my, my day-to-day activity looking at those demand side financing uh, possibilities, using technology to aggregate funding from different sources, including donors, and then driving them to quality um, uh, healthcare providers so that at least we can say they're getting good mm-hmm. quality care. Because as you know, there's a, a Lancer report that says that in Africa, uh, a lot, a majority die not from access to care, but poor quality of care. So we mm. need to start looking uh, at the quality of the care coming out of the healthcare facilities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's so yeah, thanks for thanks see. for sharing that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I wanted to uh, step back and a thirty thousand foot view and ask you, what are some of those challenges that you anticipate that our global community will need to address uh, as we move towards uh, universal health coverage through digital transformations? What at a high level, what are you seeing are some of those challenges and roadblocks? Well, uh, the the first, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is, you know, the recognition of the need for data as a human right. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's changing the way we look at data. Data should be seen as a human right because that is now the lowest common denominator to connectivity and digital transformation mm-hmm. and access to information, health information, and so on. Um Two is really around policymakers taking ownership. You know, um, the, the the trend normally is extraction of data, uh, exploitation by private sector. Um, how do we ensure that policymakers have, have the capacity to better regulate, so that we have you know data solidarity, data for public good, right? Even you know, mm. how, where do we draw that line that it's not all about exploitation and profiteering, but in terms of data for public good, um, having a governance structure that allows data to be used for public good to improve the system. Uh, so I think that that would be a, a major challenge because um, the big techs and uh, the private sector that are currently investing are, are more focused on how do we make money out of it. Third is, you know, to yeah. turn around the o- data ownership. It should really center around the individual. So when we talk about equity and human rights, I should have rights over my data and I decide who uses my data. So we need to turn it around on its head. Um, so I think that's another core, core one. Then uh, the, the last I'm going to mention is really around, um, you know, these enablers that I talked about. Um, investing in these enablers, uh, you know, do we uh, shift that responsibility to the government? When we talk about digital literacy, we talk about the, you know, the, the in Africa in terms of the, 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 the fiber cables, the electricity, because they are inter, inter ministerial, let's put it that way, inter industry, right? So you cannot be talking mm-hmm. about improving digital technology uh, with the communications unit without talking to finance because they have to release the funding and, you know, they, so there mm-hmm. has to be at a high level um, a recognition that this is really key really important and having uh, the different in- ministries come together um, to agree what their role will be and how they move that forward. You know, we often work in siloed mm-hmm. um, approaching government, you know, everybody yes. wants their own budget protected, uh, but we need to now look at it more on a horizontal rather than a vertical um, uh, lens on how we can, mm-hmm. you know, bring it all together. Um, so I, I think those are the fundamental parts and each one of them 
has a lot embedded inside. You know, digital literacy should be in the curriculum. Yeah. Um, management of healthcare facilities should be in the medical curriculum. So they never teach yeah. doctors how to be, to manage businesses, but healthcare is a business. If you're unable yeah. to, you know, sort out your inventory, have your governance structure, have your financial management system in place, how are you going to ensure an outcome? How do you make sure you follow protocol? You know, so within each of these different elements, it's really packed with uh, a lot of to-dos. Um, mm -hmm. So it's now, how do we break it down from that nice report, which you know a lot of policymakers are not going to read. <laughs> it's going to be on a coffee table. You flip through it, look at all the nice pictures. So we want to start consultations with uh, governments. Oh. Um, like I've already started with my government in Nigeria. I took the report to the, mm -hmm. the executive secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme. He was very excited about it. Ooh. He has the, the mandate to ensure that 200 million people have access to health care. And he knows he can't do it without technology. Wow. So already, yeah. uh, you know, putting this before him, getting him starting to think about what he needs to do. Already he thinks, oh, I need to talk to finance. I need to talk to communications and so on. Um, so at least to start that dialogue, the report in and of itself is an academic paper. It's not, it's not a, a, um, what I would call a manual of do mm. one, two, okay. three, four, but it's to show right. you the breadth of the, 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 the pitfalls of what you know what you if you, what will happen if you don't put some things in place or what you need right. to look out for to make sure you achieve universal health coverage so it is kind of a guide so africa may be on a different um uh, uh trajectory as china but there's similarities in terms of what needs to be in place the, the, you know mm -hmm. the, the infrastructure the governance um, and so on and so forth. So that is really what we're trying to highlight, uh, but with the youth right in the center and highlighting some key uh, messages, data um, as a human right, uh, digital transformation as a determinant of health, the need to invest in enablers, the need for data solidarity, for public good, and so on. Mm -hmm. So those are, I know it was a long answer, but I mean, as a high level, I, I think those will be the, yeah. it's a huge task, really. Um, but at least we have to start that discussion and we have to start that journey. Um, otherwise, mm -hmm. 2030 UHC, it would be a mirage. We won't achieve it. Mm. You mentioned... Uh, and as one of the challenges that this document was more so an academic report and, and to that you've started some consultations and sort of implementing some of these recommendations that were made to your knowledge, is there, are there plans to kind of create more of a detailed implementation guide for different regions, or is that up to each country or each region to do on their own? So there, there is a part two to this report, which is just now starting. Uh, we are in the process of uh, setting up another uh, commission, um, but this is now more practical. Oh. Um, first of all, yeah. we're going to break down the report and make it simpler. First of all, like okay. a one pager of some key things, you know, to make it easier to digest. That's the first thing. Two is that we are going to... Uh, regionalize implementation on dialogues. Um, so that is mm -hmm. also going to start. In fact, we're in the middle of developing a proposal uh, and looking for funding for that. Uh, some of the work we also want to embed within some of the organizations that we are familiar with. For example, Farm Access is at the grassroots of uh, some of this work in, in four countries in Africa. So it's easy to, you know, okay. find, find synergies as to, you know, I, I'm, I'm dialoguing with the Minister of Health, I'm dialoguing with the Executive Secretary of the agency. I might as well throw in, you know, some recommendations or support with some of that work. 
Um, so it, we're regionalizing yeah. it. So uh, as I said, the report was just launched October uh, last year. Uh, so we're now in the process of making sure that it doesn't remain on a shelf or on a coffee table and that mm -hmm. the recommendations mm -hmm. are taken forward. There's also an, uh, a coalition called Transform Health. You can uh, you know, also look them up. Um, it's a coalition of different organizations that are looking to help push this agenda of um, you know, the digital transformation uh, for UHC. And uh, part of their mandate is to cost what is required okay. to have the baseline to, to, to achieve UHC. So, for example, in a state um, where there is no fiber, what would it cost to even put fiber? What would it cost to, you know, set up uh, um, the structures necessary um, or even a business plan or a model that they can take forward mm -hmm. to help achieve universal health coverage? So we're now taking it down to, you know, implementation level, right? Uh, and, and that's really the stage we're in now, although we're, we're trying to mm -hmm. get funding for that because a lot of us are, are doing this uh, on a pro bono basis. Um, we okay. have our day jobs, but, you know, we focus on doing this um, for the public good. Mm -hmm. We look forward to seeing these next steps that come out. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Njire, you shared with us um, several key points that we're going to hopefully take back to, to learn from after this episode. But you also shared with us a lot of your career path and how you got to where you are right now. So what I'm curious to know is what is the most impactful lesson you've learned in your career thus far? Oh, the most impactful uh, for me is that, yes. you know, um, it doesn't really matter um, where you start in terms of your your career path uh, but the most important thing is finding something that you're passionate about that will create value for your country or for you know just create value uh, so for me it has always been what can i leave behind um and you know as you as you saw from my from my early education it was computer science so somehow I found myself mm -hmm. in healthcare, and then you know it, it, I had a light bulb moment that you know healthcare is really about data. If you don't know the people coming into mm. the hospital, you don't know their disease ailments. You, you know, as a regulator, you don't know um, how many people have malaria in your country, how how many vaccines you need to order for polio, and so on and so forth. Um, mm then, you know, you're not going to make any improvements. So you can only improve what you can measure. And uh, for me is, you know, I've, that has really been instrumental that technology um, has come to stay and it's going to play a key role in the future that we're going to have, especially in healthcare. So Absolutely. Um, how do we integrate it more? Um, how do we integrate mobile technology more? Uh, because mobile is actually um, becoming more transformational than the big AI and machines, and especially for Africa, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. you can, through this simple device, um, you can ring fence money for health, you can be directed to a healthcare provider. Um, so for me, the, the biggest lesson is that regardless of how light the technology is, it has the potential to be transformational. It has the potential to, uh, um, you know, leverage more people in uh, at very marginal cost. Um, so we need to focus on how we can maximize uh, the power of uh, digital technology, digital and mobile technology. That was powerful. Thank you. Awesome. And to wrap things up, the last questions I want to, the last question rather, I want to ask you is for our listeners, students, career professionals, people who may be in your field or other fields, what are your take home messages for digital transformation and the work that you're doing? Well, the take home message is that, you know, we need to look at 
the enablers. Uh, digital transformation is not going to happen uh, except we look at the baseline. Um, I often say there's a distinction between digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Uh, digitization is when you convert um, a process, uh, a paper process, into uh, a digital process. Digitization is when, you know, it's between organizations. So I send my data to another company. Digital transformation is when you now look at the likes of Uber. So on my phone, I can determine which hospital I want to go to. And it's revolving around the patient or the user. So healthcare needs to get to that point where you are in control because you you have the power in your hand to determine like, you know, Uber, you know, you determine where, when and where you call the driver and you go there and meet the driver, the data is all yours, you determine, you know, you can say no, yes, you authorize and all that. We're not there with healthcare. So I think that that is, we need to begin to move from manual because there's a lot of manual processing going on uh, to digitization within the uh, organizations themselves, reduce the paper because it actually costs you more to have paper. Then with that, between organizations, you can have that digitization and communication, common language uh, coding and all that, uh, medical coding for the healthcare sector, then digital transformation, which is really where we want to go. And, you know, all that uh, activity revolves around the patient who is the owner and has rights to who accesses their data and who doesn't. I think that's really what we need to keep in mind as we uh, think about the healthcare sector and digital transformation. Thank you so much. That was. I feel like we could talk to you for hours, but you're a busy person, and we know <laughs> it's getting late in uh, Nigeria. We don't want to keep you too much longer, so thank you so much for sharing that.